3D printed molds. Have you made one yet? Or are you trying to figure out how to approach doing so? Get ready as BJB continues to take the mystery out of materials. A couple years ago, we did a video on making a 3D printed mold to cast flexible polyfoam into. These were to make lightweight landing pads for a radio controlled quadcopter. You should check it out, it's a pretty cool video. Since then, we've worked with a ton of our customers who are using 3D printing for making quick molds or even production molds to cast BJB materials into. We also get a lot of questions from curious YouTubers and 3D printing enthusiasts looking for more info. A common question on some of our silicone mold making videos is, why don't you just 3D print the mold instead? As if 3D printing is the magical answer to every process. Magical process. If you're like me, when you start 3D printing, you quickly realize 3D printed parts can still have a fair amount of post-process cleanup involved. This also applies to 3D printed molds. How much prep work is it gonna to take to make our mold ready for action? Let's explore some of the key elements to consider when looking at skipping traditional mold making methods and just printing the mold. Let's go over some pros and cons of a 3D printed mold compared to typical flexible silicone molds commonly used for casting materials. Pros for 3D printed molds would be relatively fast to produce, just hit print and walk away to do other things. Relatively low cost in terms of raw material usage. Dimensionally accurate should your printer and settings be dialed in correctly. And lastly, freedom of geometry, meaning you can print a bunch of complex shapes all in one shot. The cons would be time needed to do surface cleanup. On FDM systems, it would be build lines or support structure, things like that. Or cleaning off the uncured goo on stereolithography or DLP printed parts, and then needing to seal or primer it if you're trying to cast a platinum based silicone into that mold. Draft angles need to be considered since you can't flex the tool away like a silicone mold. Undercuts. If you're casting a flexible piece, you might be able to get away with some minor undercuts. How do you deal with undercuts if you're casting a more rigid material into a rigid mold? This would likely require a multi-piece tool, which leads to surface mating tolerances where the mold pieces meet. Even being off a few thousands can cause the cast materials to leak. We get a little bit of flashing on our quadcopter foam landing pad mold due to the pressure of expanding foam. That requires cleanup. And finally, mold release. Cast materials like urethane and epoxy exhibit great adhesion properties just when you don't want them to stick. So you need to apply lots of mold release if you plan to get that cast thing out of the mold. We go through mold release strategies in the quadcopter mold video. Silicone mold pros would be, silicone picks up tremendous detail from flat finishes to class A glossy surfaces. Silicone will pick it all up. And it can do this without requiring a mold release to mess up the desired finish because silicone is inherently non-stick to many plastic, metal, or painted surfaces. Silicone will stick to other silicone and sometimes glass that hasn't been mold released. And on that note, casting materials don't want to stick to cured silicone molds. Having said that, using a mold release will extend their life cycle quite a bit. Flexibility. Silicone molds can bend and flex away from the cured parts, so you can limit stress on the parts upon demold, and you can actually mold some rather nasty undercuts not possible in a rigid tool. Whenever I start a conversation to help someone in the mold making process, I start with the expectations at the end and work my way back from there. How many parts are you trying to make? What kind of finish do you need on the part? What does the geometry of the part look like? Is it simple or complex? Do we need a multi-piece tool or can we get away with a simple open pour mold like this one? All of these questions will guide us to find a suitable process and what decisions are needed to stress over. Admit it, some of us tend to overthink or over-engineer something that could have been done simpler. And sometimes that over-engineered mold causes more headaches than help or the tools used to make the mold couldn't produce the tolerances needed to make that theory work. We'll go over that shortly. Here is the 3D printed mold we made in our quadcopter video. 
This is a four-piece mold with hinges and even a slide-out to mold a deep pocket in the cast foam part. We determined early on in the process that we would accept the surface finish out of the printer, build lines and all. The end part was more about function over form, and the build lines simply added a little texture. However, we could have spent some time and effort sanding and priming to achieve a smooth surface. With some mold geometry, this isn't unreasonable, but on some molds it just isn't practical or possible to get into some of the details. So you may be stuck with whatever surface comes out of the printer. If this is acceptable for the part you're making, great. If your part requires a nice surface, you're going to have to do something else or spend a lot of time cleaning up the cast parts, which kind of defeats the purpose of spending all that time making a mold. What about seam lines and flashing from material leaking out of the parting lines in the mold? 3D printed molds don't seal up as watertight as something like a silicone mold, which creates more cleanup after demold. If you have lots of parts to do, that cleanup adds a ton of work for you in any time you saved up front making the mold, is gone in the post-processing. With printer technologies like our Formlabs stereolithography printer, we can take advantage of the high-resolution surface straight out of the printer. Much less work is required to smooth surfaces, and the level of detail is impressive. But when compared to many FDM-style printers, the build platform is smaller in size, so you're limited to smaller parts and molds. Finally, let's look at how to combine using our 3D printer with traditional silicon mold making materials to get the best of both worlds. Here we have a couple of different molds and patterns. Taking a look at these silicone jet molds, we basically made the same mold using two different approaches, both using 3D printing. The traditional approach for many years has been to 3D print the pattern, fasten it to a board, then make a mold box, and finally cast the two-part liquid silicone around it. In the second example, we 3D printed the pattern inside of a box, so we can simply pour our silicone in, letting the 3D printer do most of the work for us. So why would you choose one method over the other? 3D printing the pattern separately allows you to reach all around the part easily to sand the surfaces smooth, fixing any defects or eliminate build lines using primer and paint. You can choose to add a shiny surface using traditional bodywork techniques, and the silicone mold will replicate those fine details. Printing the pattern in the pre-made box is fast and easy, but you have limited access to address the surface details should you desire a particular finish beyond what comes out of the printer. Granted, some printers may be better than others, but if there's a lot of detail or shape to the pattern, it may be difficult to reach all the necessary areas. I hope this video has answered some questions you may have had or given you some inspiration to think beyond 3D printing and try it on your own. I think this is a really interesting topic, but it can be difficult to navigate if you're new to mold making. We'd love to hear your thoughts, questions, or success stories in the comments below. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to our channel. Thanks so much for watching. For more mold making and casting videos, subscribe to our YouTube channel and be sure to check us out on Facebook and Instagram. BJB, continue to take the mystery out of materials.